All right, guys, and here we are on part two of ranking all the speed dual starter decks. So last time we ended up uh, ranking all the decks from the Destiny Matter starter deck, and today we are doing all the decks from Duelist of Tomorrow. As usual, we're going to be grading all these decks based on the 20 card deck you're expected to play, uh, the consistency of each of these decks, the power output, and overall the quality of the cards within each of these decks. Furthermore, we're also going to be grading each of these decks based on a curve just because they are significantly worse than a lot of the decks that we get in later speed duel boxes. So do keep that in mind. We're only comparing them to each other and not anything else. Alright, let's get started then. Right off the rip, um, Kaiba's Dragon Strategy is one of the best ones in, uh, in general, honestly. It's bordering on like an S tier, but for now I'm just going to say it's an A tier. You know, no, never mind. It's an S tier. It's an S tier. Um, just because this one is so much better than everything else comparatively when you take into account some of the cards in the deck and additionally the skill this deck has. Let's talk about it. Alright then, so here we have Kaiba's deck and as we can see, this is just a mosh posh of some of Kaiba's classics and a good amount of dragon monsters. As we can see, we have cards like Battle Locks, Rio Kinshin Power, and Lord of D. All three of these cards are two of in the starter deck, which is huge. Uh, Battle Locks and Rio Kinshin Power specifically are just fairly large monsters, and Lord of Dragon is crucial for this strategy. Additionally, we also have Blue Eyes White Dragon, Lustre Dragon number two. These are just both fairly large monsters in their, uh, in their own regards, Blue Eyes being the biggest in the game, and Lustre Dragon number two being a fairly good uh, one tribute monster. Moving down some more, we can see uh, Twin Hidden Behemoth, Tyrant Dragon, Spirit Ryu, and Kaiba Men. Twin Hit Behemoth, I like this card a lot just because it's a easy special summon from the graveyard. Tyrant Dragon is a pretty decent uh, boss monster in its own regard just because it's able to negate trap cards. Uh, Spirit of Ryu is okay just because it can get to 2000 attack points. And Kaiba Man, it's, it's probably the worst card of the deck just because it's so specific in its effect. But the effect isn't bad if you can pull it off, just being able to special summon Blue Eyes White Dragon fairly easily. Moving down to the spell cards, we have Flu to Summoning Dragon, Stamping Destruction, Cost Down, Burst Room Destruction, and Mountain. Uh, the Flu Summoning Dragon is great for the deck, and it's another crucial piece of the strategy alongside Lord of Dragons, just because getting access to a lot of your big dragons is very, very powerful. Stamping Destruction, great backward removal. Cost Down, it makes it easier to summon Blue Eyes White Dragon if you don't have access to your Lord of D. Burst Room of Destruction is one of those cards that can just turn the tide of a duel really dramatically. And finally, Mountains. It's okay, a lot of your monsters are dragons, so you're most likely not going to be the only one benefiting from the effect to gain attack points, so that's pretty cool. Moving on to the trap cards, we have Interdimensional Matter Transporter, Dragon's Rebirth, and Trap Jammer. Interdimensional Matter Transporter is a pretty cool card just because it gives you that level of protection on your monster, so let's say hypothetically you have your Lord of Dragons on the field and your opponent's about to destroy it with some form of removal. You can activate the Interdimensional Transporter to remove it from play for one turn and then bring it back to keep it nice and safe for wh for whatever you need it for. Uh, so that's a pretty cool uh, application. Dragon's Rebirth is great just because it gives you access to your larger dragons really easily. And finally, Trap Jammer, it's more niche and situational, but it's not one of those niches where you're not expected to encounter it. Uh, the effect to just negate a trap card during the battle phase is really useful, so I don't mind this whatsoever. Let's go ahead and talk about the scale now. So the skill that I've been alluding to this whole time for Kaipa is Dragon Caller, which reads, Once per duel, during your main phase, you can use one of the following skills. If you control Lord of Dragons, you can add one Flute of Summoning Dragon from your deck or graveyard to your hand. That's huge. The fact that if you've already resolved the effect of Flute of Summoning Dragons, uh, you, can access, you can get access to it once again, which is awesome. Or the other effect being, reveal one Flute of Summoning Dragons in your hand to add one Lord of Dragons from your deck to your hand. As you can see, this is a great effect because it gives you access to your other crucial piece of the deck uh, that is very, very much needed. Additionally, the fact that the, um, these cards make up three of the cards out of your 20 card deck is really important just because the likelihood of seeing one or the other is very high. Overall, I have no complaints about this deck. This deck pretty much does everything it needs to correctly. It gives you a very powerful strategy, it makes it fairly consistent, and the quality of some of the cards in the deck are just top notch. Really, really good deck. Moving on, we now have Joey, and Joey's deck is, um, kind of underwhelming, I'll say. 
Um, I don't love it, but it's okay. Um, if I had to rank it, I'd probably say it's like kind of like a higher C tier. Maybe below Gravekeeper. I'll say it's above Gravekeeper. So Joey's deck at first glance looks like it has zero identity. We have cards like Red Eyes Black Dragon, Meteor Dragon, Flame Manipulator, M Masaki the Legendary Swordsman, Alligator Sword. All these vanillas don't do anything in the deck. Oh, Baby Dragon. Um, and they're not even good normal summons. And at that, like, they're just, they're just bad. Let's just not, let's not sugarcoat it. These are bad cards. Moving down some more, we can see some more, uh, some more monsters. Uh, Time Wizard, Little Wingard, Copycat, and Geoffrey the Iron Knight. It says something about a deck when Geoffrey the Iron Knight is the best card in your monster lineup. And his effect is just he can't be equipped with stuff. That says a lot. Moving down some more, we can look at the spell cards and to see if we can get some idea as to what this deck is trying to accomplish. We can see Polymerization, Stray Lamps, Legendary Sword, Sojin, Dice Foon, and Graceful Die. Polymerization is a tool in this deck, and that probably gives away as to what the deck is trying to accomplish. Stray Lambs is a decent way of protecting yourself for multiple turns. Legendary Sword is a situational equip spell just because it needs to be equipped on a warrior monster specifically. Sojin is a decent field spell for what it does. Dice Foon is pretty okay back on removal, and Graceful Die is cute at best. And uh, funnily enough, this does affect uh, Kyofi the Iron Knight, which is pretty cool because it doesn't equip onto it. So that's nice at least. Um, so back to the polymerization. This deck is trying to fairly consistently, with uh, air quotes, fusion summon monsters using uh, cards like Time Wizard, Baby Dragon, Alligator Swords, and the materials needed for Flame Swords. Alright, let's move on to the trap cards so we can start talking about the skill. So the trap cards are Skull Dice, Kunai with Chain, and Red Eye Spirit. I particularly like the Kuna with Chain, and the Red Eye Spirit is more situational, but at least it is a good trap card. Kuna with Chain has a lot of versatility, in 1, giving your attack mo your monster a nice attack boost, and for 2, allowing you to change the battle position of an opponent's monster. So that's great. Skull Die, it's in the same boat as Graceful Die, just because they're cute. It's luck based, whether or not the uh, attack reduction or attack gain is uh, favorable, or at that, just noticeable. And as I said, Red Eye Spirit is very situational just because it only works on Red Eye's Black Dragon, a one of in the deck. Moving on to the fusion cards, we have Flame Swordsman, Thousand Dragon, and Alligator Sword Dragon. Personally for me, I would have loved to have seen uh, Red Eye's Meteor Black Dragon, I think that's the name of it, the big old fusion of uh, Red Eye's Black Dragon with Meteor Dragon. It's not here, and for some reason we have Meteor Dragon here. I make it make sense, please. But... If that card was here, this would have boosted the uh, the rating of this deck significantly, because it would have given you a worthwhile boss monster for the deck. But let's go ahead and talk about that skill of his. The skill that I ended up deciding for Joey to get was Palamalization, which reads, During your turn, you may reveal one normal monster in your hand. This turn, that monster can be substituted for any one future material. If you do, the other future material must be correct. This skill can only be used once per duel. So. As you can see, this explains as to why Joey has so many vanillas in his deck. The fact is, you're expected to open up a polymerization, which at least is a 2 of in the deck, and go ahead and fusion summon into one of your 3 fusion monsters. And now we go back to what I had mentioned earlier. I would have loved to have seen uh, the Meteor Black Dragon fusion monster in the extra deck, just because at least it's a worthwhile boss monster just because it's so large, but besides that, like, Thousand Dragon makes little to no difference in a duel. Uh, Bait Alligator Swords is okay. And, and Flame Swordsman is kind of a joke, I'm not gonna lie. Looking back now, I might honestly just put it below the uh, Gravekeeper strategy just because the likelihood of you making one of your bigger monsters isn't super high. And at that, you still do need to open up that polymerization. So, I don't know. It's, it's such a weird scenario with this deck. So, yeah, give me your guys' thoughts in the comments section. Low-key, I thought about putting this in D tier also, but I think it'll be nice and I'll leave it in C tier, just because it's there's so much wrong with this deck, <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. Alright then, so last deck for Duelist of Tomorrow, we have my Valentine, and she has a hybrid strategy of Harpy Ladies and uh, Amazonas. 
and this was an interesting one to create. In my opinion, this deck is probably hovering between an A tier to B tier. Um, let's go ahead and say it's... I'll go ahead and put it in A tier for now, and I might change it in a future video, but for now I think it's going to sit in A tier. Alright then, so as I said, this is a hybrid deck of Harpies and Amazonas. As we can see, we have Harpy Lady 1 through 3 here alongside the Harpy Lady sisters. The Harpy Ladies are decent monsters in their own regards, Harpy Lady 1 giving all your wind monsters a decent attack boost, Harpy Lady 2 has a more niche effect where it negates a flip monster effects, and finally Harpy Lady 3 has the funniest effect I've read on a Harpy card, just preventing a monster your opponent controls from attacking from 2 turns after this card attacks. It's such a weird effect, but you know that's old Yu-Gi-Oh for you. And as for Harpy Lady Sisters, this card I don't mind whatsoever just because it's a fairly easy special summonable monster off the effect of Elegant Eatus. So, you know what, it's pretty okay. I don't want to talk about the, the Amazonist monsters quite yet, so I'm going to go ahead and talk about uh, the these two cards right here. I personally like Bird Face in this deck just because it gets to add you a Harpy Lady from your deck to your hand, so you can add any of the three of them, so that's pretty cool. It's a uh, This does give the deck some level of consistency. But also, it's a fairly large monster with 1600 attack and defense, so that's not half bad. And as you can see from a lot of the decks we've been grading, 1600 seems to be like the baseline for a decent attack monster. If a monster eclipses that, it's significantly better. And as for Sonic Shooter, it's kind of funny just because it can randomly win you games in certain game states because it has the ability to attack your opponent directly with 1300 attack points under the guise that your opponent doesn't have any back row. So. It's a, it's a situational, yes. Is it a bad card? It's okay. Alright, now on to the Amazonist cards. We have Chainmaster, Swordswoman, and Sage. Chainmaster is kind of cool just because it does give you the chance to rip a card out of your opponent's hand into yours. So that's pretty cool. Uh, Swordswoman does, it does reverse burn damage to your opponent uh, whenever it attacks into a large monster. So again, this is another weird card that can kind of just randomly win you a game. And finally, Sage does have a niche effect where it does get to destroy back row of your opponent under the guise that it does attack. Um, I don't personally love Sage in this deck in particular just because she doesn't really benefit that well, but it's not bad. Moving on to the spell cards now, we have Elegant Egotus, which is a 2 of in the deck, Triangle Ecstasy Sparks, Cyber Shield, Harpy Hunting Ground, and Amazonas Heirloom. Elegant Egotist being a three of uh, a two of in the deck is huge just because for one, Bird Face gives you access to your Harpy Ladies, and you already have Harpy Lady 1 through 3 uh, in the deck, so that's really, really good. And gives you access to your Harpy Lady Sisters or any of the Harpy Ladies. And getting just multiple monsters on the field is really good. Uh, Trigo Ecstasy Sparks is more situational just because it only helps Harpy Lady Sisters, but it's not a bad card. Cyber Shield is great just because it gives your Harpy Lady monsters a much needed attack boost. Harping Hunting Grounds is a phenomenal card for the deck just because it gives all your Winged Beast monsters a really nice attack boost and whenever you summon a Harpy card, it pops back row so it constantly adds pressure to your opponent. Heirloom is a great equip spell for the, uh, the Amazonas cards, making them really annoying to out. Onto the trap cards now, we have Amazonas Archers, Windstorm of Etiqua, Shadow of Eyes, and Wild Tornado. I've already talked about how I don't really care for Shadow Tornado as back row removal, but at least it's there. Shadow of Ice is kind of a cool trap card because it prevents your opponent from playing defensively. And Amazonas Archers and Windstorm of Etiqua are both really good cards in their regards. Etiqua being the better card overall just because it just it allows you to change the battle position of all your face up opponent's monsters um, on the field. So if they have a large monster that you can't deal with, you can switch to defense mode to make it easier for yourself. And Amazonas Archers is a really annoying trap card for your opponent to have to deal with during the battle phase because reducing your opponent's monsters by 500 is pretty sizable. In my opinion, I think the skill that I liked the most for my was Tribal Synergy, which reads, If you have an Amazonist monster and a Harpy monster in your hand, you can reveal them both to draw one card. So, the likelihood of that happening isn't that low, and just getting a draw out of it is pretty good. But the effect continues. If you control an Amazonist monster and a Harpy monster, draw two cards. Honestly, I can't hate that. Because, as I said, a lot of the cards are really decent overall, and the Amazonist cards are also pretty good, so the likelihood of getting them both on field isn't super low. Of course, each of these skills can only be used once per duel. In my opinion, I think this is a really well-balanced deck that does a lot of things right and has a really decent power output that I like a lot. And compared to the other strategies we've seen so far, I think this is a really, really powerful strategy compared to everything else. 
but I still think that the Kaiba strategy is significantly better just because the power output is insane. But yeah, in the comment section below, let me know your thoughts, see if you agree with me or disagree. Uh, stay tuned because I should be able to get the next episode out fairly soon, within like a day or two. Um, and we are getting pretty close to come, uh, finishing this. In the comment section below, as usual, let me know if you have any suggestions as to any other speed tool content you'd like me to consider making. Um, as always, I read all your guys' comments and for you never know, one of your guys' uh, ideas in the comment section below could end up being a video in the future. So with that being said, Thank you so much. If you did end up enjoying today's video, consider leaving a like and subscribe. But with that, I've been Topsy. Thank you for stopping by, and I'll catch you on the next one. Bye.